Hi, I'm Toby. And I'm Nick. And welcome to the Pure Property Podcast from Track Capital, where we talk about all things property and property investment. The aim of the podcast is to give you our industry insights and knowledge in bite-sized chunks to help investors invest intelligently. Yes, hi everyone. So a very busy week uh, this week in terms of news in the market. So we've had um, reports that Richie Sunak is potentially going to extend the stamp duty holiday by three months. Now that uh, was actually leaked and uh, documentation, I believe, but the budget is due on Wednesday. So I believe it's today uh, when the podcast is being released. So keep your eyes peeled on that, but hopefully we'll get confirmation there. I'm sure put a lot of people's minds at risk especially those buying at the sort of uh, the higher entry levels. Um, so yeah, that's some potentially some positive news and we'll just sort of even things out for a, for a couple of months. Uh, we also had some new data released by Zoopla. Um, their house price index came out, which shows again, strong growth. I think it was 4.3% on average in the 12 months to January. So again, your Manchester's, your Liverpool's all performing exceptionally well. 6.8% growth uh, Liverpool is currently sitting at for the uh, previous 12 months. So really positive there. And then just just as internally as well, it's actually been an exceptionally busy month for us. Um, actually, our, our best performing month since uh, just under a year. So since March 2020. So yeah, it's all happening. And I know obviously you've been busy yourself, Toby, with investors. But uh, why don't we move on to look at what we are discussing today? Yes, so this week we're going to be looking at the Manchester property market. Um, as we mentioned last week, we've done our top three locations before, but we thought it'd be good to dig deep into uh, the most prominent locations that we're finding sort of best and popular for the property investments at the moment. So uh, Manchester was the first one on our list, and that's what we're going to go over today. Absolutely. So, yeah, Manchester in itself, it's kind of developed a a brand or a reputa- reputation for uh, a number of reasons, both in the property markets and just generally. Um, it receives a lot of interest from uh, overseas visitors and they might be visiting for university, um, for social events, uh, visiting on sporting occasions. Uh, we've now got very well-known brands based in the city. So you've got BBC, ITV, Google, um, a lot of the big banks there as well. I've got offices, PwC, Barclays, Deloitte. So it's really, really seen uh, high levels of interest um, on employment and the day-to-day sort of on the day-to-day sort of living side of things as well. Uh, on the back end of that, we've had um, the go- government incentives and uh, investment as well. So looking at the Northern Powerhouse and how they're supporting local businesses and helping to grow the economy. Um, but yeah, all of these uh, factors have basically added up to, to Manchester becoming very, very widely known now, both domestically and internationally. So if we just focus on um, the property world for a second, um, it's the, ultimately the reason why it's got a lot of attention from investors um, is ultimately because of how it's performed, right? So in the recent years, you know, five, 10 years ago, um, it really started to take off. And I think back in I think it was 2018, 2019, we had um, Go Compare, the comparison website, named it as the best place to be a landlord in the UK. Um, and that was, that was considering a number of factors. So property prices, yields, uh, the population growth, uh, the number of lettings and management agencies, new housing developments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, basically, they named it as the, the number one out of the 31 cities which were reviewed. So yeah, it's really rose to... Um, rose to popularity in recent years and what we're looking at today is a couple of the reasons why it's performed so well and as you may have guessed this is ultimately due to the the underlying investment fundamentals in the city so what we're going to quickly discuss now is what those fundamentals are and how they've caused Manchester to grow uh, and get the reputation it has so Toby do you want to kick us off with the first sort of investment fundamental that's sort of made Manchester what it is today then? Yeah, definitely. So first, we'll look at one of the fundamentals, which is uh, education. So Manchester is actually home to some of the most prestigious universities. You've got the likes of the University of Manchester and Manchester Metropolitan University. And it also boasts some of the country's highest student retention rates, which is actually at around 51%. 
that's second only to London. So that is good to see um, with the with those universities attaching uh, attracting students and retaining them. Obviously, that's good for the local economy and the local property market. It has a student population of around just over uh, 96,000. Um, and Manchester is actually one of the biggest student cities in the whole of Europe. The city also boasts a substantial international student population. And as we've mentioned, um, it has a lot of recognition from overseas. Um, and that is down partly to the, the student um, attraction from international students. And the student population sits around just under 18,000 um, coming from overseas. So the increasing number of the sort of fresh faced professionals as we can call them um leaving leaving university and then they then stay on um to work and become part of the manchester economy and part of that manchester scene and we are seeing that continually expand over the years uh, which is helping really drive that that young hungry manchester economy absolutely i mean we've got to think what students ultimately contribute to uh, to a city so they're spending money in a lot of the local businesses uh, they're helping um, employers obviously the employers are looking to uh, recruit that that top tier talent uh, and which were coming straight out of these high quality universities russell group universities etc so yeah definitely i mean an investment fundamental education in itself so big big university presence is what we look for in any city we're investing in, uh, but it's really, really prevalent in Manchester. So moving on to the next one, then uh, we're focusing on investment and regeneration, both in terms of uh, public and private spending. So one of the big um, sort of kickoff initiatives, which really, really caused a lot of people to focus on Manchester and the Northwest in general was the Northern Powerhouse Scheme. Um, you may go in a few years back now, it's been touted around for years, this sort of catchphrase and brand. I think it first came about in the, the 2016 um, autumn statement. Uh, it's then got attention since. But uh, ultimately, this was, I mean, the way the government spun it is they're looking to create a, you know, a super connected, uh, really competitive, flourishing private sector with a highly skilled population. Um, and, you know, high profile businesses in the in the north region, northern region. So Manchester was very, very, uh, it was almost a centre point of that of that planned spend and uh, the, the scheme itself. Now, we won't go into full details on what the actual sort of strategy was, uh, but you can actually go online now and read the original 30 page um, strategy document. Um, it just shows sort of their plans and what they were looking to do and the initiatives they took, such as um, uh, beneficial commercial lending rates to private businesses, you know, much more investment into transport and infrastructure etc cetera, etc cetera. but yeah the long and short of it is the northern powerhouse was a big government um investment program which has driven a lot of uh, a lot of projects in the city uh, just taking a look at some actual um live projects and some big regeneration schemes across manchester uh, we'll list off a couple of examples now again you can go online google these and do some research it may inform your investment decisions now looking at these developments it's going to be Things such as residential apartments, uh, offices, outdoor space and, and parks, uh, leisure, retail, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All the things that you would think would make up a sort of a master scheme in a and an area uh, within a city. So the first one, Pomona Island, uh, Manchester Waters. You've got the Peel Group that are doing a, a massive uh, project and putting a lot of focus into that area. Um, they were actually involved with with Media City, for those that know that scheme, with Legal in General. Uh, so they're pumping uh, nearly a billion pounds into, into that local area. I think we've had Boris Johnson visit there in recent years. So there's a lot of uh, new build projects going up on there. So that's going to drastically change over the next few years. Uh, Media City itself, probably the most famous um, de waterfront destination um, in, in the Northwest. Uh, so you've got uh, it's in Salford, but you've got the BBC base there. You've got ITV base there. You had four hundred million pound worth of investment pumped into that, um, and that's done wonders for for Manchester itself and the surrounding postcodes of the city centre. Um, we've got planning approved for phase two. That was a few years back, so they're, they're chucking in another billion pound worth of investment there as well. So big things for for Media City on the horizon. Spinning fields. Uh, it's an area of Manchester which is very um, sort of city focused, so to speak, with a been compared to the likes of Canary Wharf and the city itself. So that's the sort of £1.5 billion worth of projects going along 
or regeneration projects going on in spinning fields at the moment. And that's where um, Barclays are based, HSBC, who I mentioned earlier, PwC, Deloitte. It's a big corporate presence there. And then just the last one we can reel off quickly. Um, you've got Noma, which is a, a large development um, where the co-op head office is going to be, so the cooperative group. Uh, they've already spent £800 million on that scheme. But yeah, so looking at Noma, Spinning Fields, Media City, Media City Phase 2, and then the Manchester Water site, uh, those are a couple of big, big regen project examples to get you started. So yeah, we'd suggest you uh, have a browse at them. Yeah, exactly. And I think people um, seem to forget that not so long ago in, in real terms Manchester if you look back was nowhere near where it is now and this this has happened over a good good few years but people that got in early um, must be absolutely laughing now when all this was going on because obviously it all starts in city centre and it slowly mo- moves out as we've seen with Media City etc and it, it's quite it's quite interesting when you look at this in comparison to a city such as Liverpool for example because Liverpool's kind of on the verge of now becoming the next Manchester, and I know we're, we're talking about Manchester today, but it is quite interesting to see that you can you can see the progression that's been made in Manchester, and it's it's really really interesting and 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 very good to see, and it's it, you can see how well it's done for the economy as well. It's brought some excellent money into the city and it's done very good things and it's only going to continue doing more because this isn't stopping as Nick said there's there's more regeneration and development on the horizon that's been approved and going ahead and going through um that's why sometimes when we get asked the question well oh it isn't isn't it oversaturated in Manchester no if anything it's under um the the supply is is not there to meet the demand there's still so much going on and, and it is still a good time to get into Manchester absolutely yeah and as 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 you pointed out um some some great stuff that has gone on and is continuing to go on but let's move on to the the next one so employment or employers so obviously part of the the economy in manchester is of course a part of uh, the job roles and the jobs and the, the people working in the city now, you've already touched on um, a few of the big companies that are uh, in Manchester now, um, and that they really are some strong, strong companies, uh, which just shows the attraction to Manchester as a city itself. Uh, as you mentioned, the co-op group uh, building there, going there, BBC, ITV, Google, Kellogg's. There's just so many there now, so many big names, which is good. Um it's a bit like a football team sometimes. <laughs> when they start to do really well, all the big players um, across the world start to be attracted to there. And that's pretty much what we're seeing with Manchester. Um, we're starting to see all the big players uh, sort of moving there and focusing on there, which is really, really exciting to see. Almost 70% of the employment in the city centre region is actually in the knowledge intensive industries, which actually makes it very good, really exciting and accessible for the young professionals. Again, we come back to that education side and the attraction to that. It's a, It really is a breeding ground for, for that type of, of demographic um, and people going to there to, to help with the economy. And throughout the recent years, Manchester has actually evolved into one of the best digital and technology sectors in the whole of Europe. Um, so it as we said, seeing that progression, seeing the companies going there, see how it's evolved and the type of talent that it attracts in terms of job roles um, and companies is really, really exciting. And I think that's only going to increase over the sort of medium to long term as well. We've, I mean, you've got to ask, what, why are these employers going into Manchester? Yes, it's for the talent, um, but also it's for the, the lower costs. So it's, you know, we we don't have to be as... Uh, rigid as we were a, a few years back and you know be based in in zone one in London or in the city or in Canary Wharf etc etc um, you know employers are able to go up to to Manchester rent you know space for significantly cheaper um, and still attract that that quality talent uh, as you know this this goes hand in hand with the the social and the, the leisure and entertainment in the city because it attracts people uh, and quality quality staff uh, and as a result the the employers can attract the the same caliber of uh, of team uh, talent that they would in the in the southeast region so and obviously i do think covid will will accelerate that as well with obviously all the remote working and, and bits and bobs like that so yeah that's that's really interesting to see uh, as i touched on the another fundamental to look at is is the social scene uh, the shops and the leisure and entertainment so 
looking at um, uh, Manchester itself in terms of the social side. Uh, obviously, we've got two huge, huge sports teams there. So Manchester United and Manchester City. Um, I was looking at some data on, you know, what what sort of uh, contribution does a having a high profile football team or something like that contribute to the local economy? And there was a report a few years back. I think it was going quite a few years back, actually, uh, 2014, 15, if I remember, I'm um, saying that it, sports teams added 330 million pounds a year to the to the local economy in Manchester if you actually look over the last 20 year period 2.5 billion pounds worth of funds been driven into these local small businesses um, and and people living within Manchester from the sports team so yeah it really goes to show the the ripple effect there and that's probably only increased as well uh, as the likes of Manchester City have really grown in their sort of reputation um, and obviously we've got big um physical infrastructure to handle live social events live music etc etc with the etihad manchester arena etc um and then moving on to the sort of shopping and the day-to-day side of things we've got the arndale center trafford center exchange square you know brands like selfridges and harvey nichols have come into the city so it's a really really strong reflection of the 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 demographic in manchester you know this this overseas presence uh, a lot from from the far east etc that want to see high-end luxury brands Um, and that's reflected in sort of the restaurants and the nightlife scene as well Um, and as i say it's really really important to have this mix um, because ultimately it does attract people into the universities and into the uh, into the employers as well so yeah shops the the leisure scene the social scene etc is another big uh, big fundamental that we look at Yes, exactly. Um, Another fundamental which we we look at is transport links. In terms of public transport, uh, Manchester is actually probably one of the the better connected cities that we have here in the UK. Uh, It has a a metro tram system that actually runs across the whole city. And I believe they're looking to extend that um, as well. It has obviously trains and buses which offer the transport options across the city and also the rest of the country. And you also have Manchester City Airport, which connects the city to international destinations as well. But the the future side of it, uh, which is really exciting, is, of course, the HS2, uh, which we'll talk about when we talk about probably many other cities that we cover um, in these sort of episodes. But You've got the HS2, which is really going to boost the connectivity of Manchester as a city. It's going to be coming from the Manchester Piccadilly station and also Manchester Airport. And just to put into perspective how much it's going to improve the connectivity of the city, if we look at the uh, the Birmingham interchange, so the current time for that is 106 minutes. And the HS2 is going to bring that time down to 37 minutes. But the, the most impressive one, and which is very exciting, is, is London. So the current time to travel to London uh, is 127 minutes. The HS2 is going to bring that down to 67 minutes. So you're talking of a commute of just over an hour to get from London to Manchester and again, we we really sort of see this as a massive catalyst that's going to be excellent for the city in terms of the property market in the future. Because if you think of the prices that you pay in London and surrounding areas um, and with, with companies now moving out of London to Manchester, the commuting distance is, is going to make it so accessible for so many people that it's going to drive people to the area because the prices are going to be more affordable. So the commute will just make sense. So that's really exciting to see. Uh, and also the HS2 from Manchester Airport, that will do uh, London, which currently is 144 minutes. That brings it down to 63 minutes. So again, just over an hour, which is really exciting stuff. I mean, it is a long project and we know it's not going to be overnight, but if you are thinking long term and, and looking ahead into the future, when you're considering your property investments that's definitely a factor to think wow this could really be very beneficial for the property prices um i'm very sure of that yeah definitely definitely and i re- one of the points you touched on there is I'd, i would love to see the uh the prices of, of train tickets go down from from london to, to manchester i'm not sure that will happen but we as you know toby obviously booked to go up to uh to manchester in a few weeks time to see a few developers and you're paying you know there's three of the team going up there you're paying 300 pounds odd so it's, it's exceptionally expensive mm. but at least now it will be uh 
be a bit quicker, which is good. Okay, so moving on to the next point, then we're looking at development and construction. So what's actually happened happening in terms of new schemes being delivered to the market and the pipeline of new developments in place. So it's firstly, and the probably the biggest point for us is that it's typically a good sign when you see such significant construction taking place in a city. So if you look at London skyline, you know, it's, it's, even throughout 2020, there's constantly cranes and new buildings and things going on. For us, it shows really, really strong confidence from often, you know, corporate and institutional level developers and and just funds being pumped into the city. And that's why the construction is able to take place. So firstly, if those guys are showing confidence in a city, then it can only be a good sign. But uh, yeah, the other thing to think about, of course, is when you look at the population of cities like Manchester, if it's Manchester City Centre or even it's Greater Manchester as well, you know, a significant number of people are there now and that population is increasing year on year on year. So when we're talking about potential oversupply, we're still not at that that stage yet. You know, there's people have been saying that about Manchester and sometimes Liverpool for, for years now. Um, you have to remember the UK is still an undersupplied housing market, even in the city centres. And whilst, yes, we have seen a ripple effect of some people looking, both tenants and our new occupiers, looking towards the edge of the cities, you've got to think in a year or two, it's likely that this, the city centres are going to be busting again. Um, and ultimately, look, if, if you're buying in Manchester, Liverpool, it's very rare that you're going to see void periods or significant void periods, should I say. So, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll look at a couple of them. Um, data point shortly uh, on that but yeah the, the long and short of it is you don't really have to worry too much about an oversupplied market if you're buying in the middle of Manchester now uh, okay cool uh, one of the things that I did want to mention is we've got um, we actually passed this by one of our development partners recently a company called De Trafford um, we were looking at the the pipeline of stock um, happening in Manchester so what uh, they sent us is a, um, a development link in the city showing all the um, active schemes at the moment being built, uh, projects which have approval or have just started construction. Um, and then what you can do is actually filter out um, certain schemes. So you're looking at an interactive map of either what has planning and about to be built or what is being built or the transport links. So that's a really, really useful thing. So you can see immediately what's happening in the vicinity of where you're considering buying. So if you, you know, speak to us, you put, pick out a development, we'll show you, you know, what's happening in that immediate facility. So uh, you can give yourself the best chance of picking somewhere, you know, as desirable as possible. So yeah, do check the uh, the uh, episode comments for that or episode description uh, and you'll be taken through there. And just to finish off on a couple of other bits and um, one, a couple of resources you may want to look at as well, uh, JLL 2020 residential market data. Uh, they were showing 2,500 homes are needed per annum on average over the next 10 years uh, with an average supply of just 1,150 over the past 10 years. So that's one of the largest imbalances in the UK outside of London. Uh, long and short of it is you, you, they need more city centre stock. Um, and they did actually mention as well that they expect um, the housing supply of new builds to, to actually slow down uh, in the coming years, to which will in turn uh, put um, support on, on higher sales prices. So do bear that in mind. In other words, they're saying there's going to be a slightly lower supply, so there's probably going to be better capital growth. Um, they also mentioned just about the, the economy of Manchester and, and the Yorkshire being the strongest in the UK over the next five years. But uh, yeah, that's one of the largest real estate agencies in the world, 77,000 employees worldwide, huge dedicated research teams. And they're telling us that, look, there's, there's still huge, huge demand uh, for, for housing stock in, in Manchester. Um, and another thing, just lastly, you might want to look at is a crane survey, believe it or not, from from Deloitte. They do an annual crane survey survey where you can see what's being delivered in Manchester in terms of residential stock, uh, hotels, education facilities, uh, offices, student accommodation, etc. And you can really actually look at the numbers of, of what's being delivered. So that's a really, um, really useful research, which I was uh, sort of browsing through uh, earlier today. So, yeah, hopefully that gives a quick, quick snapshot of the um situation of the development pipeline but yeah my top bit of advice would be to look at that link uh, with regards to what's what's happening at the moment in Manchester it's really really interesting to see and in addition to that on that um on that interactive map that I mentioned looking at uh, you'll you'll see a lot of the the developers that we 
we work with, so the likes of Sourced, X1, uh, De Trafford, Fortis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Obviously, some of the bigger guys, Renica, Capital and Centric, MCR, etc. You can have a good look through and see who's doing what, where they're developing it, where the hotspots are, and really just be hyper focused in your research, looking at you know real life data rather than you know some people go to the extent of looking on the planning portals etc it's just a really nice way to sort of condense it but yeah just to finish off on that as i say we you know we do we are working with a lot of the the major schemes in the city so we can speak you through sort of various options and hopefully catering to your uh, to your requirements yes and that's development and construction then now on to the final fundamental that we're going to cover and probably what a lot will consider as the most important it's the market performance so the property market performance that we're seeing in manchester so i'll start on that with capital growth if we take and luckily we just had the latest home track report uh, recently if we take the year on year growth as it stands in january that's sitting at an increase of 6.3%, which is very strong. It was second only to Liverpool. But if we then compare that to the previous January, so January 2020, it was only 3.5% increase. So it really has jumped. And again, it's not what you would have thought would have happened if you'd have said last January, oh, by the way, there's going to be a pandemic. You would have said, yeah, you're crazy. There's no way prices would increase. But that is 6.3% increase. That is very good. If we now look at that over a five-year period, um, I pulled some uh, data off of Land Registry. So looking on Land Registry, the Land Registry only goes up to December 2020. So from December 2015 to December 2020, there has been an increase of 38.19%, which is around £55,000 average increase in property prices in Manchester, which is which is really good, really good. That is very strong. Um, and yes, yeah, sort of people that got in there earlier, a few years ago, probably rubbing their hands right now and doing very, very well from it. Uh, next, I suppose, rental yield. Nick, do you want to cover rental yield? Yes, absolutely. So, um, yeah, you mentioned obviously market performance is being a big factor that we look at look at just to, just in general. Um, so, yeah, the capital growth, just to touch on that very quickly, and that home track slash um, Zoopla data uh, is basically a capital growth report of the biggest 2020, sorry, of the biggest 20 cities in the UK month on month. So what you'll find is basically it's a rolling capital growth rate for a city. So I've been watching, looking at that report on a monthly basis for years. You always see the same cities in, in, in the top sort of rankings. So Manchester, Liverpool, surprisingly, Edinburgh and Leicester are always up there as well. But other than that, it's your Leeds, your Sheffield, your Birmingham's. But Manchester and Liverpool are just constantly at the top at you know, four and a half, five, six percent. Um, and then, as you mentioned last year, three and a half percent. So what I just wanted to pick up on there is even in 2020, one of the most challenging years with Brexit uncertainty, obviously the pandemic, lockdowns, not being able to do valuations, not being able to get mortgages or process transactions as quickly as we would like through legal teams, we're still seeing six percent capital growth. And when you add that on to your rental yield, you know, people are asking, is buy to let still worth it? Well, absolutely. Yes, it is. When you look at that compounding effect over the next 5, 10, 15 years, significant gains to be made in what's relative to the the risk appetite, right? So it's a safe investment. Yes, you may make more gains elsewhere in the stock market, et cetera, if you know what you're doing. But in terms of the risk profile, if you want to keep that modest and low, you can get a nice, nice, steady, uh, strong return on investment. So yeah, just touching on the rental yield then. So I mean, you're seeing projects in Manchester city centre with as low as a 3% net return now. And now this is, you know, not what some agents advertise, but when you really, really look at what you're paying for service charge, what you're paying for your ground rent, what your management rate is, plus VAT, um, you're looking prime Manchester at, you know, 3% in, in some cases now, 3 to 3.5%. Three and, and you can go to just outside the city centre. You know, we've got schemes that are doing 5 to some 6% net uh, again, genuine net returns, um, or you can go further out to sort of the commuter belt locations and um, sort of maybe even drive that up a touch more. Um, I think um, one of the data points I was looking at was from Housie, 
who are effectively an online agent. Um, and I think they were saying the, the average yield was uh, just over 5% in, in Manchester across the board. So um, I think that was the 10th best in the in the uh, UK. Um, but the long and short of it, and just to be very direct, you know, you buy in Manchester, you typically buy for capital growth. Um, it is meant to be the, or JLL are forecasting it as the highest growth, sorry, the highest growing city over the next five years in terms of capital growth. Um, when you add a half decent rental yield on top of that, still beating London easily. I think London was 2.3% on average in that report. So if you can get a 4% net plus the country's leading capital growth in a, in a city with very, very strong investment fundamentals, you know, ultimately that's a very safe uh, you know, long-term investment for you. Yeah, and great point there. Um, focusing on, on yield is obviously important, but it is good to also take into account uh, the capital growth as well especially when you look back because that factors in into your return on your investment but also although we can't guarantee capital growth we can we can only predict it and look at the data and the fundamentals which suggest it's going to be there when you do add that into the mix of your returns as you mentioned we've got some schemes where they may be sort of coming in around five percent just outside the city center net but when then when you add in the capital growth factor over the next five years average it out um, they go up to sort of around sort of your 10 percent uh, net levels, which again is really, really good and very strong, especially in comparison to to other investments out there. Um, so it's always always good to do that and factor that in. Um, but next, we can go on to the the rental market. So what what the potential voids like, lettings, uh, market, tenant demand, etc. So to to sum it up quite easily, um, it, it's quite handy that Home Track actually look at these these uh these figures as well so they've actually got manchester with a time to rent at around 16 days on average which is just over two weeks pretty normal very good very strong um so i think that's that's very encouraging to see and again just demonstrates the demand there they've also got the average rent at £773 per calendar month. Um, of course, these are just averages, so just bear this in mind. This will change um, from different areas of the city or just outside of Manchester, etc. Um, and then they have the affordability level, which stands at around 29.2% of a single earnest salary. So again, the affordability levels are still there. They're still very good and, and very appealing um, to renters. So those three factors um, are what are really driving the Manchester rental market at the moment. So you can see your voids are going to be uh, very low. You we're only looking at um, just over two weeks to rent a property out. Um, and you've got great demand there. And the affordability levels means you're always going to have people there wanting to take these properties. Yes. Yeah. And I think the other point I would just stress on that as well is, yes, the time to let is potentially up to 16 days on average. Um, but when in, in actual sort of practical terms, if you put, bought an off plan project, the management company will be lining up tenants months in advance. And just to put that into um, practical terms, we've got a student project which is due to complete in July, which students can occupy from September. But the management company is advertising it now. And that would be the same for residential projects. And then even when if you let to someone for a year, obviously months before that potential renewal date or that potential exit date from the tenants, obviously they're going to be lining tenants up as well. So in a strong rental market with a half decent management company, you should really, you know, be able to minimize those voids to to virtually uh, nothing if you if you've got a half decent property and and you're organized. And um, that may be an obvious point for, for some people. Um, but yeah, I suppose the key takeaway there is just be organized, know your renewal dates, communicate with the tenant in advance. Um, and yeah, just make sure everything's sort of transparent and clear. Yeah. And that is all the fundamentals that we're covering for Manchester. So, I mean, overall, just going over what we have today, it clearly demonstrates, as we have on numerous occasions, the strength of Manchester as an investment city and area, especially if you're looking for that that safe bet um, where you've got a, a good uh, potential for the capital growth aspect. 
you're going to get good strong yields and just an overall solid investment. It, the, the risk factors do come down uh, a lot. As we say in property investment, there is always going to be risk involved. Uh, and depending on your risk appetite, um, it, it's best to obviously invest with your risk appetite in mind and minimize the risk as much as possible in line with your tolerance. And I think Manchester really does build a case uh, for that being a good, safer bet in comparison to other areas. And that, again, shows why we have a lot of overseas investors and why it's continually growing in attraction and attention from a lot of investors, especially the more hands off, because again, it's it's now demonstrated and got a proven track record of the returns, of the capital growth, of the regeneration, of everything going on. Um, it, it's now got that, that, that track record where an investor can look at it and go, yeah, if I don't know too much about England as, as, a, as a country and where to invest, like London used to be, that's the first place they go to because they hear about it, they read about it, they look at the data and they go, yeah, that's where I want to put my money. And then it just becomes a snowball effect and that's what we're seeing. Um, It's only increasing and increasing um, as time goes on. Absolutely. And I think that's reflected in in our... uh in our marketing efforts as well you know where are we seeing the most traffic for searches where are the most clicks coming from Um, and it's a lot of it is huge huge interest in Manchester from the likes of the Middle East uh, Saudi the UAE Jordan Kuwait Qatar and then out to um, the Far East as well Hong Kong's obviously a massive one at the moment with a lot of people looking to um, relocate here following the government initiatives Um, and obviously China we do um, advertising on on various portals out there as well and again significant amounts of capital looking towards the northwest and in particular Manchester so just to summarize on my side um, just to split uh, those two few points we've discussed into categories so when we say investment fundamentals we're looking at uh, education investment regeneration as the second one uh, employment as a third shops leisure and social as the fourth um, and then transport links so they're what i would refer to as the investment fundamentals and then a couple of other factors for you to consider in general when you're reviewing sort of locations overall is development and construction so what what's in the pipeline what's the competition like etc and then obviously just finally the market performance so what's the past capital growth what's the current capital growth and what's the projected uh, future forecast what's the likely rental yield of the property going to be or the actual return on cash invested so your roi if you're basing it on a mortgage and the the actual capital you put in Um, and then obviously on the letting side as well so void periods your demand in general so hopefully that's a a couple of good um, sort of uh, benchmarks for you to consider where you can compare to other cities do a bit of research and, and have a look around and see see what your thoughts are and uh, but overall as i say we're, we're very very confident in manchester and so are a, a lot of people out there at the moment that's great so why don't you introduce what we're going to be talking about next week Okay, next week, we're going to go on a bit on the more pessimistic side. So looking at the potential risks with property investment, you know, we want to try and be authentic, transparent and open. So what are the couple of things that you have to tick off and to make sure investment is sa- your your investment, sorry, is safe um, and going to be, you know, profitable in the long term. So we'll do a deep dive into uh, what the risks and the security factors involved in investing in the UK property market risks what risk there's no risk in property investment what are you talking about I thought you just <laughs> you put nice. your money in you put your money in and then you just collect collect uh the income every month isn't it i thought that's how it works i must be oh, in, a, in an ideal world <laughs> <laughs> no no definitely it's going to be a good episode um and yeah we'll base it on sort of the the average risks of an investor as we as we always say risks do uh, change depending on the investor themselves but they're predominantly risks that you definitely have to consider and look out when you are investing in property and sometimes they aren't that there'll be ones that you may not have think, thought of even if you've already invested in property um so it's yeah it's going to be a good episode i'm looking forward to it and uh thanks for tuning in this week and we'll see you next time take care bye-bye cheers everyone bye-bye